All right. Uh, thank you very much, Matthias. And thank you so much, Maxon. It's awesome to be here as part of the 3D Design and Motion Show. My name is John Lepore. I am the Chief Creative Director at a studio called Perception. Uh, in a moment, I'll introduce my colleague and brother from another mother, Doug Appleton, who's our awesome VFX Director at Perception. And we're going to be talking to you about how we leverage one of our favorite tools, Cinema 4D, in the work that we do at Perception. So first off, if you're not familiar with Perception, uh, I'd like to give you just a, a little bit of background on us. Um, we're, we're very excited. This is going to be our 20th year in business. The uh, studio was founded in 2001. We're based in New York. And we have an amazing team made up mostly of generalists or multidisciplinary designers. Almost every artist in our studio uh, uses Cinema 4D to some extent. Some people dabble in it. Many are deeply experienced in it and, and a lot of the, the rich features and functionality and, and extensions of Cinema 4D that are, that are out there. And everyone in our studio helps to contribute to a really specific, like an almost oddly, bizarrely focused nature that we have with the work that we do at Perception. So uh, what do I mean when I describe this, you know, very specific focus that we have at Perception? So we talk about is this, this hyper-specific focus that actually ends up having two paths to it. Uh, we think of them as these parallel worlds that we're orbiting around and bouncing back and forth in between. These two worlds are working in doing uh, creative development for film and designing for next generation technologies. Uh, these two worlds are almost split for us 50-50. We spend half of our time working in film, half of our time working in tech. And so what do I mean when I'm saying creative development for film? Um, well, we've been really fortunate to work on some amazing blockbuster films uh, where we're doing everything from designing visions of how technology exists in the future in these films or other similar world building exercises around these rich cinematic universes as well as also working on other design-driven elements of these stories, whether that's uh, montages that help move the narrative along, or certainly a lot of work developing title sequences and other branding-based elements for these films. So uh, to give you a little more of an example as to what we're doing in film, I'm going to play just a little bit of a, uh, a montage of some of the work that we've done in film. So, uh, as I mentioned, you'll see a lot of instances of how technology interfaces, holograms, new ways of interacting with tech are represented in film. And, and we love having these opportunities to do these, these sort of experiences in these movies that have really rich uh, worlds that are built around them, really uh, high ideas of how the future will exist and, and we're always looking for ways that we can contribute to that. We take it unbelievably seriously and we really geek out very hard on this stuff and trying to figure out ways to create visions of technology in the future that are inspiring and invite audiences to have uh, their imaginations run with these thoughts and these ideas and, and also just help to create something that still feels plausible and a little bit grounded in reality. Now, beyond just designing tech in these films, we find ourselves creating title sequences for these films and looking at all these other ways that we can help to brand these stories, package them, and uh, and create something that helps to convey the, the filmmaker's vision for what these films can be. So that's you know some of the work that we bring to film i think this is probably what we're best known for if you're familiar with perception at all you've probably heard of our film work before um but that is only half of what we do and the other half of our time is spent working in this really fascinating space 
of uh, working in real world technologies where we're collaborating with some of the biggest names in the technology landscape as well as in some very specific niche industries that are really fascinating. When we're working in this space, we're finding ourselves focused almost exclusively on emerging technologies or technologies where all of the problems haven't been solved yet, places where there isn't a template for success or already a best practices formula for how to work in these technologies. Uh, we found ourselves having some amazing collaborations with uh, emerging technologies like the Microsoft HoloLens. We did some very early development in helping to figure out how interactions can exist in 3D space. And I'm sure you can imagine how Cinema 4D was really helpful for our team as we were prototyping some of those ideas and concepts uh, to help Microsoft when they were just beginning to think about, even way back in 2014, how we could think of interacting with a mixed reality or augmented reality landscape. We've also been finding ourselves doing a lot of work in the automotive space, and this has been really fun for us. Uh, we find that really exciting vehicles like the 2017 Ford GT align really well with our mindset and our aesthetic and our creative approach to pr uh, problem solving for next generation technologies. When we're working on vehicles like these, we're typically working on them where we're developing the digital systems that exist inside of these vehicles. So whether it's an exotic sports car like the Ford GT, unbelievably fun to work on and contribute to, or other exciting vehicles, our most recent being the, uh, the 2022 Hummer EV, which we had worked on really closely with General Motors to develop the entire digital experience that exists within this vehicle. So if you, uh, if you have a Hummer EV and you climb aboard it, you're going to see all of these screens illuminate and come to life in the interior of the vehicle that uh, enable you to take advantage of the capabilities of this wild vehicle while also reminding and reinforcing the driver of the personality and, and, and what a distinct experience it is to be in a vehicle like the Hummer EV. Uh, a ton of fun to work on systems like this. Uh, working with General Motors, we had the opportunity to really push the boundaries of what we've ever seen in an in-car experience. And you can see in here, there's a lot of incredible 3D renders, some of which are pre-rendered animations that play within the vehicle, some of which were actually translated into real-time systems and animations that are fully interactive while you are operating an awesome vehicle like the Hummer EV. So um, from there, I want to talk just a little bit about, you know, why, why are we using Cinema 4D at Perception? Like, why is this one of our key tools of choice? And, you know, I, I think you can imagine we use a lot of the other tools that are out there uh, that, that many of us use, uh, a lot of predictable and, and standard tools. But Cinema 4D has been something that's really worked unbelievably well for us in the studio. Uh, more than anything, because it is a designer's tool. It's something that we feel works really well with creatives who are just trying to rough out and build out certain ideas, concepts, and thoughts as quickly and efficiently as they can. Uh, we find the tool to be really accessible and easy. We've had people that come into the studio having zero experience with it, and after a month in our environment, they're they're hooked on it, they're, they're leveraging it, and they're finding ways to incorporate it into the work that they're doing, even when it's not traditional, like sort of motion graphics work, but more uh, user experience design, uh, prototyping interactive uh, tools, we find Cinema 4D is unbelievably useful in just about everything that we do. And of course, Cinema 4D, especially in the last uh, five or six years, it allows you to go deeper and deeper and deeper with the platform. There's tons of incredible uh, extensions and plugins, and especially with being able to do unbelievable rendering with tools like Redshift, uh, we found that the bar just keeps getting higher and higher for what can be executed with this platform. And so we're, we're so proud and so excited that we've had a long-standing connection with this software and even with Maxon themselves. We've been uh, really close with the team at Maxon probably since 2007 or 2008. And it's it's been an, you know amazing to see the growth happen both with the platform and also with the incredible community 
that surrounds this incredible tool. So I want to talk today about, and, and I'm going to pass the mic in a second to Doug, who will get really deep into some awesome details around one of our most recent projects that was a really exciting one for us. And that was doing some design work for the uh, Disney Plus streaming series, WandaVision. If you're not familiar with WandaVision, it's your pretty run-of-the-mill story of a magical witch and her rose robot husband who are trapped inside of a reality construct that's themed off of different eras of sitcoms, you know, that old nutshell. Um, this was an awesome brief to receive uh, in the middle of last year, while in full lockdown and whatnot, we had received a brief from Marvel Studios asking us to pitch them concepts for a closing title sequence for WandaVision. And we were exploring a lot of different ideas, and, and pretty quickly we were focused or honed in on the theme of the show, which is that ultimately, over the course of this series, we go through several different eras or generations of sitcoms in which the story is presented to you. And they do this incredible job of creating this very uh, accurate, very dedicated representation of these different eras of sitcoms. Their 1950s sitcom episode, they actually filmed in front of a live studio audience. It's very authentic. It's very, uh, very precisely done. But we also want to make sure that in the title sequence that we were creating, we were bringing a little bit of the traditional Marvel Cinematic Universe magic into this story and how we could present these ideas. So uh, we started by pitching them several different ideas and concepts. I think we probably started with four or five overarching ideas. But there was one that really quickly started to bubble to the surface. And it was a concept that we referred to internally as the magic of television. And just thinking about the fact that uh, TV, especially thinking of it through the eras, it's, it's maybe a little less romantic to think of it as LCD pixels. But when you think of a cathode ray television, and it's this glass tube, this almost jar, this volume that's filled with like static electricity and chemistry and magic. Like I remember being a little kid and like inching up as close as I could to the television, pressing my nose against the screen and feeling like the static electricity in my face and making me think it was going to, you know, uh, give me brain damage or something. There was just something so mysterious and, and almost a little intimidating about this big glass box and, and what was happening inside of it to create these beautiful images and ideas. So we thought it'd be cool to dive into the medium of television as an aesthetic, as a way of thinking of this story. And the first thing that we did was we worked closely with our, our buddy Chris, Re Chris Webb, who runs uh, F uh, FX WRX or FX Works. It's this incredible laboratory or, or almost experimentation lab for uh, cinematography. Chris Webb is an incredible uh, director and cinematographer who helped us by putting together some in-camera tests of different ways that we could examine cathode ray television tubes and look at them and really examine the details with in interesting lenses and getting really close up in macro and playing with different projection and distortion techniques to look at these images from as many different perspectives as we could. And this ultimately led us to this idea that, you know, we could look at the world really up close and really feel like it is a natural television. But then we also want to say beyond this, this really in-camera sort of approach, what happens when we actually push in between the pixels? And there we knew immediately we were going to jump into Cinema 4D and start figuring out some ways that we could leverage some of the awesome tools and capabilities of Cinema 4D to fly through a landscape made of pixels, literally weave between the pixels, 
and create something that could start with something that felt like familiar television. And as we get deeper into the, the pixel matrix, we start to see disruption. We start to see elements breaking apart and blowing apart and ultimately unraveling with the same sort of uh, arc and excitement that we see over the course of the series of WandaVision. So uh, from here, I'm going to hand it over to Doug, who's going to take us into a deep dive as to how we put some of these scenes together for the main on end title sequence for WandaVision. Hi, I'm Doug Appleton. I'm the visual effects director at Perception. And today I wanted to talk a bit about how we created the main on end titles for WandaVision um, and more specifically how we created that RGB pixel look. And I think a good shot to break this all down is this house shot. So the first thing we want to do is uh, build a house. Um, this particular house that we have, it's not wildly complicated or anything, so I won't go into too much detail about it, uh, but there are a few important things to take note of. Um, first is that uh, for this effect to really work, all of our models had to be um, in evenly spaced quads. Uh, now that's because when you look at a TV, the pixels are all laid out in a nice grid. Uh, nothing is, you know, they're not all over the place or anything like that. So uh, we want to make sure that we have a an evenly spaced grid to work with. And I can kind of show you an example of why that is. Um, on the left hand side, we have our nice evenly spaced grid here. On the right, roughly the same, uh, same amount of faces, uh, but not evenly spaced at all. And so if we just uh, turn on our pixel clones, you can kind of see what we're, we're talking about here. Uh, we really need this evenly spaced grid over here so that our pixels line up and look like pixels as opposed to this kind of mess of things on, on the right hand side. The next important thing that I want to talk about is we only need to build what we need, right? So uh, this sounds like kind of an obvious thing, like we don't need to build the interior of the house, but we also don't really need to build any of the back walls of the house or the roof of the house or anything like that. Um, and I can show you, you know, a little bit about, about what, we're, what we're playing with. So our house, um, really simple. We have a simple face to the house and I'll just kind of quickly, quickly do this. Um, so this would be the, for example, the front and we'll adjust our width segments to get our nice, uh, our nice tight grid here. And then let's put, uh, let's put some windows on this house. I always want to kind of go back to our default on this. So there we go. Let's see that. And there that can be, you know, one window here. So we'll say that's one window there one window here. This also helps at this point. If we turn on our, uh, our wireframe so you can see what we're looking at. We'll do a window there and we'll kind of duplicate this on this side. And then we also have shutters, right? So we want to add some, some shutters to our windows. So let's do that. We'll go into this one move that over. Let's make that a little thinner. We'll call this one shutter and we'll reduce our polys there. Right. So that's one shutter. Move that there. That's another shutter. And then we would kind of continue that all the way along for all of our windows. We also want a door. So let's make this one our door. I'm just going to bring that back to the center. Open that up, do a bit of that. All right, this will be our front door to the house. Uh, I'm noticing all this stuff isn't very organized because I'm doing this, you know, kind of quickly. In a, in a perfect world, <laughs> we'd organize this a little bit better. Uh, but I just want to give you, you know, a, a little idea of, of what, we're, what we're building here. There we go. So I'll move that guy over. All right. So we're starting to get the the front of our house. Uh, we also have a roof 
I think our roof is something that's pretty, pretty simple as well. We just kind of take this piece, we'll rotate it like that, and then we'll also shrink that down, move that up. Right, and so now we have the roof to our our house uh, and you know using the magic of television uh, we'll put it in the oven we'll take it out and now we have our house that we've built uh, there's nothing crazier in here than what I was just doing you can see our house is this it's a series of planes uh, we only built what we needed our roof is a simple roof. We even have the gutter. We've got our windows with our shutters on it. Our steps are just the front face of the steps because that's all we need. Our walkway, just a simple plane. And you can see how this whole house now is built pretty, uh, pretty simply and it's pretty light too. It allows us to kind of move around quickly, find the best shots. Uh, we have our camera in here already, so we can play this. And then we have our our beautiful house, all nice, evenly spaced quads so that when we clone our pixels on here, um, they'll all line up, line up nicely. So now that we have our house, uh, how do we pixelate it? Um, this is probably the easiest part of the whole thing and like I just alluded to uh, it's a simple cloner you know we just clone the pixels onto onto the house which is why we needed our quads in the first place uh, so I have uh, what we have lovingly referred to as our hexels um, they're pixels but they are hexagon shaped uh, if you've seen WandaVision uh, you'll know that the hexagon is a running motif throughout the entire series, not just in our title sequence, but um, throughout the whole series as well. There's there's wallpapers, decor, there's a bunch of stuff that's hexagon. So we decided to continue that into our, our sequence. In our hexel, we have split into our RGB here. This will make sense when we start talking about the, the shader that we created for this. Um, and then that is in a, a null, so we just have one, one thing. So we can take this, bring it into our house, and we'll just look at, you know, one one kind of simple thing. So let's create, uh, let's create a cloner, and we're gonna make this a uh, object cloner, right? Because we're cloning onto the object of the house. And the thing we want to clone onto, let's do uh, the house back. Right, now let's do uh, let's do a wall, right? Yeah, we'll do uh, we'll do wall. And what we're cloning, we'll just paste in our hexels from earlier. Throw that in there. Let's turn this house off so you can actually see what's happening. So we have all of our hexels. They're not lined up on our nice grid that's because we want our distribution to be vertex and now you can see we have our hexels uh, on on our wall um, the the thing that you'll notice like as we do more and more of these because we have a lot it starts to get pretty heavy for something um, like this, we can do is change this to multi-instance and then viewport mode. We could even just do points uh, and that should speed it up significantly. I think for us, it's not really important that these look like our hexagons in the viewport, as long as they look like our hexagons in the, uh, in the render. So again, with the magic of, of television, Let's go check out what it looks like when we have our hexagons on everything, right? So we have hexagons everywhere. If we were to render this right now, it wouldn't look like much of anything, right? We have a house with dots all over it. Not quite uh, much of this 
pixelated look that we want. But I think this is where um, we get to some of the really exciting stuff. And that is creating the shader, creating the shader um, that makes this look like a pixel world. So let's dig into some of the cool things we did with this material to create the look. Uh, but first, we need to talk a little bit about what a pixel is and how it works. So I'm not gonna go down a, a deep rabbit hole with this, because um, you can go way down a deep rabbit hole with how, how TV works, but the short version is that on a TV screen, uh, the image is broken up into a red, green, and blue channel. And each of these little color blocks here uh, is called a pixel. And the way that you see different colors is by the blending of brightness between those different channels. So for instance, if you had purple, you'd have more red and blue and less green. Or if you had orange, you'd have way more red, a little bit of blue, a little bit of green. Uh, and that's how generally uh, TVs work. So what we wanted to do was come up with a way for us to create the same look uh, without having to fake it. So let's create a new material and make a basic version of this um, in a simple scene so we can really see what's happening. So we'll open up our Hexel screen here. You can see we're broken down into our three, uh, three colors of our pixel. The first thing we want to do is create a cloner and we'll make a grid to do sort of a simple TV screen uh, shape. Let's do a honeycomb, we'll throw that in there. Uh, I have some settings that I was using before, so we'll do 150 by 200, and then our width and height, 2.25, and our height, we'll do 1.75. Uh, as you can see, it's a little too big. So we want to scale these down. So I think our other scene is a lot smaller. There we go. And then the last thing is take our fixed clone, turn that off. And now we have our tiny hexel grid. We'll zoom all the way out. As you can see, it gets a little heavy and we can see our grid. One thing we can do to help with kind of the heaviness of this is click on multi-instance. We'll set this to point. We'll set this to points and that allows us to kind of move around a lot freer. We'll still get color information on here. And then when we want to see the split, we can, we can render it. That split we wouldn't see with our material anyway. So let's add uh, some color to this thing. The way we're going to do that is go into MoGraph, Effector, add a Shader Effector. And then in the Shader Effector, let's attach an image. I'll put up everyone's favorite. Uh, please stand by. You can't really see this right now. Uh, the reason for that is because in our cloner, we want to take our color and set it to black. Um, and that'll allow all the color from the shader to come through um, and none of any of the cloners other colors. So now we can see our, our please stand by. And if we were to render this, right, we get something, we get something looks like, uh, looks like this. Great, we have please stand by, but this isn't really doing what we want it to do. Right, if we zoom all the way in here, you'll see that every single one of our pixels has one color value to it. You know, these are white, those are this muddy green color, that's kind of a, a purple. Right, we're not getting that RGB split. So the way that, that we're doing that uh, is with our redshift material. So let's make a new material and we'll open this up. And there's a few things that we, we need here. The first thing we need is our color user data. And I'm actually gonna remove this material because we don't need any of that right now. I'm gonna plug this directly into 
our surface. And what this is going to do is take our uh, data from our shader and it's going to pipe it through Redshift. So we'll put it on our R pixel. The other thing we want to do, very important, is our attribute name. We want to grab MoGraph and color. So that's going to look at our, our MoGraph colors and pipe it through. Um, so now you can see we have our material here. Uh, but still, it's just a, it's just a solid color. Um, so there's a few more things that we need to do to split this into our RGB channels. Uh, the next thing we want is, as it sounds, we want a color splitter. Let's grab the color splitter and we'll plug this into our input. So this is going to take our image, take our image as the input and output will be red. And now when we look at this, let's move this up here. Cool. So now when we look at this, um, and the reason why I, I shift this because there's more we're going to do to make it red, um, but as it's black and white right now, you can't really tell what's happening. So I'll move it on this so you can see everything is uh, is red, but it looks black and white, right? Because this is just grabbing the luminance values of our red channel. So the final step of this is the color maker. And what that's going to do is we take our red, we pipe it into red. So we're saying that this black and white luminance map here is supposed to be red. And we plug it in there. And now you'll see everything is red. So if we put this back on the red pixel, you should see this load. And now you can start to see our split. The other two are still grabbing all of their color from the shader there. So let's quickly just rename these. We'll make some new ones. So that's our red. We'll call this one green. And we'll call this one blue. And I'll throw these onto our different pixels so that as we're doing this, you can see what's happening. So let's open up our green one. And we're just going to take the green into green and remove that. And now we have our green and we open up our blue one. We'll plug the blue into blue, and remove the red. And now we have our, our TV screen. And if we were to zoom in on this, we zoom all the way in the areas that look, let's down here, we have some other as you can see what's happening is that we're piping in luminance values into the red, green, and blue channel. So the luminance of the red channel, the green channel, and the blue channel, and that is getting us our pixel split. So when you're this close, uh, it just looks like, uh, like nonsense. But as we zoom out and get further away, you can see that please stand by shows up again. Uh, one thing that is good to do with this because what's happening is our luminance now is being driven by, you know, these number of, of pixels. So we're not getting a fully bright image. Uh, I just like to crank up the exposure as we're previewing this just a little bit to make it kind of look a little more normal. We can play with the contrast too. Uh, all this is doing is brightening the image. This is something that we would do in post Anyway, but while we're we're looking here, we'll do it. We'll do it here. Um, but this is great to see when we pull back this far. You know, this purple down here, that looks like purple. Um, but if we zoom in on it, you'll see that what was purple is actually right. Just our. Uh, are our pixels. And then everything that's super bright over here, this is sort of the, the white colors. So that's the very basic, kind of basic version of this. What this 
does is you know it gives us our, our TV screen. But there's a lot more that we can do with this, right? We have you know a lot of our off pixels are just black. There's not really a lot of information there. There's nothing um, nothing interesting there. So one of the things we did was we also added a bit of a of a twinkle to this and there's a, a really kind of easy way uh, of doing that. And because we're using these shaders, we can build up all of these shaders on top of each other. So we'll just add another shader. We'll duplicate that and we'll call this one, we'll call you twinkle one. Let's throw that into our clone. You'll see it gets super bright now, um, but our Twinkle one, let's remove our image. And what we'll put in here is a noise. And we don't need that noise. We want this to be kind of small, right? We want this to be pixel sized. So if we shrink this way down, let's hang out, something like that. And then we can, uh, we could adjust our contrast down here. We can adjust the brightness because what we're really looking for is just to get a little bit of interest in our dark areas and to break up kind of the, uh, the luminance of some of these, right? Some of these pixels are brighter, brighter than other ones. The other way to adjust this once we have something we like here is just going to twinkle down here and reduce that, reduce that there. And because we're using the, the shader effector and noise, we have all the power of uh, cinema's noise, we can then add animation to all of this. So let's click on our twinkle again. Let's go into our noise. And just animation speed. Let's just add a little bit of animation. So we'll say two, and this probably isn't gonna play very well in there, but in here, let me crank this up a bit just so we can see it more. We're gonna play this here, right? You can see how now we have a little more life in this, right? The all of our pixels are are starting to to twinkle and have have some life to them. This is great if we're using a still image to drive this, um, to add this life to it. But also there are times where we used footage to to drive kind of our, our color, um, which already has some life to it. But the the twinkle is just a, it's a nice added touch. Let's take this uh, one step further. And let's say we wanted to, uh, you know, art direct this a little bit. We have our, we have our look, we love it, it's great. Uh, let's kind of, uh, let's see what else we can do. So let's add another twinkle on here. I'll call you twinkle two. And then you should see this get super bright in the, in the twinkles. Uh, let's make another, let's just add a, a different kind of thing in here. We'll, let's pump this up back to what it was. So this should start to look kind of busted as soon as that loads. Oh, actually, the problem is I got to add this to here. There we go. Uh, so now I have this gross looking, gross looking color on here. No one, no one really likes that, but let's say we do like it. Um, we can we can art direct this a bit by using the fall off here, and I'm just gonna put a spherical fall off on there. And actually, let me let me dock this guy over here so we can see what's happening. Um, with this, we can move this around. We can move this around and, and see this update. So now 
that's on the left hand side we could kind of move this into into the middle if we want sort of more of this noise and distortion in the middle uh, we can even you know go back to our shader and let's remove that and put our pixels back on it right now this is just adding that back on back on top so I've made something that looks very very gross <laughs> right now um, but you can see how you know by combining the shader effectors and splitting all of the color channels how you do have a lot of control uh, over what it is we're doing one thing sorry one thing I totally missed as we're looking at this is we want to go into our parameters let's turn off scale there we go because uh, you don't want the shader effector to affect the scale at all we just want it to affect the color There you go, that looks a little, there you go, that's looking a little better than what I was just talking about. Um, but you can still see how, you know, we've added this brightness to it, uh, where we where we want it to, to fall, right? So we want this right hand side to be a little brighter. Uh, we can play with this to, yeah, remove the fall off on it. So this is what we what we're doing for the whole house, right? We're applying this texture to it. We are splitting up our color channels, piping images into it, and then kind of art directing what gets brighter, um, what gets darker. So if we were to go back to the full house which is not a pun I intended on saying for this sitcom related uh, sitcom related series. Uh, but you can see kind of all of the different shaders we have on here, like some of it's filling the house, some of it's for the flowers, some of it's to pull uh, lines on the roof. And if we were to render this guy, It's gonna take a second because it's gotta load up everything. Like I said, there's a there's a lot of pixels in this thing. There we go. So if we were to render render this guy, you can see you can see these same same techniques being applied to this much more complicated model. It's all still based on the same simple uh, cloning ob cloning onto an object and using our RGB uh, split. So each one of these, like this house, we had primarily red in this instance. Um, you can see sort of the blue kind of popping through uh, some green over here. But at the end of the day, if we were to zoom in on any one section of this house. You can see how this is all still based on the same principle of our RGB pixels. Like down in here in the house, uh, we have almost no blue, no green, so we're just seeing the red, but up on the banister because we wanted to call out the edges to really sort of paint this house with light. Um, we're pulling in some more green and blue, making that area area brighter. And the same principle is applied to to everything. It's on the trees, it's on the fence, it's on the uh, on the dome for the sky. Right? It's uh, it's everywhere in this thing. Uh, so that's the the very quick uh, rundown of you know, how we, how we uh, made, made WandaVision, how we made the main titles um, for WandaVision. You know, there's, we could go on for hours about, about all this stuff. Anyway, that's my, that's my time. Um, 
thank you so much for listening. I'm happy to answer any questions about this or anything else that we made during WandaVision or not WandaVision related. Uh, any questions at all?